of community nutrition summary which is said in the topic. Just one thing, a lot has been said, I agree. One thing that um, I didn't hear mentioned was about uh, this whole thing of being marginalized and can we put that as a policy of um, infrastructure? Because I've traveled to up to Maua and I've seen there's too much food. They don't know what to do with their food. But you go from, from Kitale, going west for court uh, to Turkana and those other areas, then there's drought. So there's this issue we don't see of infrastructure. You find where there is plenty of food, there's infrastructure. But where there's no food, you look around, you're in the middle of nowhere. So can that, uh, with the agricultural list, mm. also highlight that because they, they interact with the powerful people. Yeah. And they need to know that it is in their interest to look at the other areas, build those super highways towards Garissa, towards where, they, so that there's that economic you know, empowerment, open it up, so that people can buy, they have the money to buy the food, which, whether it comes from Maua or wherever, mm. then I don't, you know, I can buy the milk, Not I can buy the food, so that's... Very clear. Uh, William Macharia from NDC. I have two uh, questions, maybe comments. Um, um, one of them, from the discussions that have gone on, uh, mm. uh, we have said that we have uh, policies are there, yes. that are in terms of implementation. I do not know whether we have a policy on the private trader. How we are able to maybe get access to the affordable uh, food. So in terms of affordability and accessibility, do we have a policy on how the private tr the trader should maybe be assisted in terms of getting the food from the affordability to where there is no food? Number two, uh, from the discussion that have gone on, I'm yes. looking at uh, the issue of um, political causes of food insecurity. And from the discussion, you have said that we have the knowledge, we have the technical know-how, we have the resources. Could there be people who are benefiting from food insecurity in this country, and therefore they want to perpetuate the continuous cycle of insecurity? For personal benefits. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm George Mungaro Konji from the Civil Society. I have uh, several questions. Mr. Shaw, while striving to embrace a proactive food policy as one of the solutions to the Kenyan food security, what is your take on the economics of agricultural adaptation to climate change? Agricultural adaptation to climate change. Now, a quick one to Mr. Gulet. Now, having told us what you have done in Kwale successfully, and if you are to advise the government on the viability of Galana Kulalu irrigation project as a means of addressing food security, what would you do? <laughs> well, <laughs> now, the final one is to Mr. Yabe. Given the controversy surrounding the GMO foods, even in the science world, what is your take on that? And now, since Carlo is not here and you are a partner of Carlo, we, have, we are now experiencing army homes in Western Kenya. What is your take on that also? Wow. Thank you. I'm Sadi Kanyangu Nakaya. By profession, I've been sworn as marketer. First and last question it is this. Thank you. Uh, from experience, yes. I have worked with, I'm 57 years old. We thank God for that. I have worked with so many different classes of people, mm. particularly I managed to work with the, an American citizen. Uh. He taught me in the USA, when they come on the site of budgeting, mm. Their budget takes five years, not one year as done here in Kenya. Now my question is, uh, on, the se uh, uh, on the food security, why Kenya government they can't put effort and we have, let's say, five years budget so that when the weather comes, whatever it is now we are seeing, we cannot have shortages in food in this country. Uh, my name is Akich Kwach. 
I'm representing, I work with small scale farmers in Kisumu County. And my first question would be to, uh, to Mr. Richard, uh, maybe not just uh, specifically to ADC, but uh, to the larger agricultural ministry. Would you be knowing uh, projects that are targeted at small scale farmers uh, to address the food security? Because from where the constituency where I come from, if you, if you go even now with the rains, you will still find almost three quarters of the land lying idle. So uh, I would appreciate that. Uh, the second one is a general observation and maybe might be uh, directed to Mr. Robert Shaw. Okay. Uh, we've talked of food policy, but they, we've not uh, touched on the land policy. And I think this uh, just uh, came up uh, recently in Kiambu where the real estate is mushrooming so much that you see Kobe estates being uprooted to build houses, but we do not need a fertile land to put up a housing. So the government should actually work on that. Otherwise, we'll just be remaining with the land that are not fertile. Now, we have wonderful people, as you've just said, people with good ideas. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised if you really interviewed people when the audience, when they came in, mm. I'm sure three quarters would have not given you a satisfactory answer as to what ADC is. Yet, we have wonderful brains there. Can they really go out and educate Kenya? Thank you very much. But I'll, try, I'll try and uh, do justice to some of them. Um, well, the ones that were pointed at me especially. Um, Yes, this issue of the of surpluses and then another part of the country having nothing and it rotting. I think if, if you go back uh, to, to, to quite a few years ago, one of the problems we used to have is, to, is, is uh, restrictions on transporting. Um, uh, anybody who has a long memory will remember that there was a time when you actually w would be stopped and check that you weren't carrying two debbies of potatoes or whatever. And so I think one of the... No, th th there was that. It was that. And, and, and I, I think what we've probably got to do with that whole subject is see how we can uh, just work through all of the, the transport issues in particular and see what impediments there probably still are and how to ease them so that basically people can get it from A to B and you know where there is a market Kenyans are very entrepreneurial they'll get it so I, I suspect that it's it, it, that there, there probably are still some 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 some, some handbrakes on the movement of, of, of food um, not, not least of course the, the traffic police um, Food insecurity, is there an incentive to, in, to, to perpetuate it? Uh, yes, at times I'm sure there is. We, we, see, we see in particular with, for example, sugar. Uh, you know, we, we're told, I mean, the, we, we, op we open the newspaper and we're told that uh, a supermarket or this or whatever, is restricting uh, the you know you to, to taking a two kilo bag only. Um, so I think uh, again we, we've got to th th there is a profit level and you can see it a little bit actually uh, with the, the the price of maize. There's like a parallel market at times. Quite often. Uh, the National Cereals Board will be out of sync with the market price and vice versa. So you, people will, will keep their maize back and, and, and uh, knowing that you know, there's possibly a shortfall and they will get more and they can sell it direct to, 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 to millers than uh, privately than to give it to National Cereals Board and wait 
I don't know how many months for payment. So yes, there's, there are you know that I think creates a, 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 you know a situation where you, you know there's this there's, there's probably I wouldn't say there's a surplus all round, but there are small surpluses in different places which are being kept because it, it is, you know, the way the market is, uh, you either sell it privately, you don't really want to sell it to, 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 to serials board and then wait uh, the, 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 the length of the time. And that's, that's, uh, and that's one of the problems with, with serials board, is, is, is it's, you know, it's, it's always been the payment uh, side of it is, is very slow. Um, agricultural adaptation uh, to, to, to climate change. I, I, I think we. I haven't gone into that very much, but I think I think the other two panelists have. I think it's something we really need to take on board. Um, a lot of the. Especially if you start looking at any old textbooks, I mean, there's there's nothing about it. We really do have to factor that in. Um, it, it's there. It's just a, it, it's gradual, but it's creeping along. Uh, and uh, I I just don't think we we probably just like I I didn't factor it in. I mean, I'm I'm very aware of it, but it's probably also the issue that it, it is a longer term thing. So at the moment we're you know, we're talking more about drought and army worm, or oh, floods, or whatever it is, rather than that long-term factor. So I think we d we do need to, to 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 make sure that we we accommodate that. Um, land policy, oh, gosh, I mean that's a, a a thorny thorny one. I I think the best way. Uh, probably the best direction to go is one where you provide the incentives uh, for that. I'm not certain that any <coughs> to try and start taking. I mean, the, the other extreme on that is you, you you're actually taking away land from some people and giving it to others, etc. I don't know under our constitution and under several other rights how easy that is, but what I would have thought is that you have some very, uh, you, you go into the incentive and disincentive uh, side of it so that you get the best utilization out of that. And that probably is, is a better policy than saying, you know, let's divide it up and give it to ABC. Uh, as, as, as my, my colleague from ABC said, that, you know, that over the years there's been there's been quite a lot of of, of uh, infringement. That's to be polite. Yeah. Um, I think that that will, I've tried to do justice, but I'm sure, I'm sure I've left a few gaps somewhere. So on the first one, on the issue of uh, surplus in one side and lack of it on the other side. I think this is true, uh, even as of this current drought. And what happened with the current drought is that um, something different is occurring. Not too much food is being distributed. Uh, the government still does, but we have um, managed to talk to the government to see that after the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul last year, there has been a push and a drive to say you should do more and more cash transfer to people. They're given money, they can go and buy what they want to buy. It's not the beans and the maize that we always give to people, uh, whether they, it's their staple diet or not. Um, so in the current drought, one of the things that we've done, for example, at Kenya Red Cross, 80% of our appeal is very much based on cash transfer. We're giving people money through M-Pesa, and through other form of cash transfers that are available in those communities so that they can decide to buy what they want to buy, which answers part of the question of for where there are surplus in a devolved country. If we are talking about 
even devolving these markets. Uh, market dynamics are amazing. That you can go to a place called Tangle Bay in Baringo County and people give people cash, or you go to Barwesa uh, again in, in Baringo County, or you go to Kisarian Baringo County, uh, Baringo South. Now I've talked three constituencies Baringo North, Baringo East, and Baringo South, where you're giving people cash. The fact that they have a mobile phone. One thing this country can celebrate is the, in, is the innovation of M-Pesa. And, and we are, I think, a leader in the world in, when it comes to money, uh, mobile money. And, and really, y sitting in Nairobi, you transfer that 3,000 shillings to a mama or a mze in Tangul Bay or Barwesa or in Kisarian or Makutani, and they're celebrating, they're dancing, because they have a network, Kuna Mtandao. And as long as Mtandao is there, they get the money. And you'd be surprised how many... Uh, people have taken their commodities there from Yandarwa or like Kipia, all these places to go and sell their, 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 their commodities. Markets are full of food. When there is drought everywhere, markets are able to find where the money is, market will find itself there, the, the owners of the products. And this is what we need to do. And I say that to the head of state in, in, in early February before, we, before even the drought was declared. And he gave directive in, in accepting that there was drought when he announced. He also said to the government, to the, office, to the various ministries, that as much as possible, let us do cash transfer. Because we know with food, there's corruption. There are people in government, in ministries, through procurement, that's where they make their big commission. And through transportation with logistics, that's where they make other commissions. Then the food doesn't reach the people in the quantities and the amounts that was sent from where it ought to be sent. When, it, when I do a cash transfer of 3,000 shillings, it will reach the beneficiary, the exact amount. Mm -hmm. If they'll be charged 60 shillings or 30 shillings by M-Pesa, it's something else, but they get the money. So we are making sure that we send them, you know, 3,060 shillings so that the 3,000 is intact. And you see an old mama, a show show celebrating and dancing to be getting this money. And then what they do with the money is their business, not my problem. For accountability, uh, my accounts department can work very easily to account for that money because the results are there immediately. So I guess that can be worked. But the second question which is linked to this was the issue of infrastructure. This is the biggest problem in our country because for a lot of things, there hasn't been, extra, there hasn't been any extra kilometer of railway line until now what the Chinese are doing from independence, from the lunatic train that we had, you know, almost 200 years ago. The only new development is what the Chinese are doing now. And the same way in terms of infrastructure, in these arid and semi-arid parts of Kenya, which is two-thirds of Kenya falls under this category, two-thirds of our country, where basic infrastructure is what is lacking. Okay? But the late Foreign Minister God, uh, Bonaya Godana would tell me that once the road Isiolo to Moyale was done, if he was alive today, he would have an abitur, world-class abitur in a place called My Corner on that superhighway. And in four and a half hours, he'll bring the carcasses here in Nairobi and sell the meat here. So what we need in Baringo is to have a world-class abitur somewhere in Marigat or some place to avoid this cattle rustling. So this meat that we eat in Nairobi that is... Uh, uh, cattle rustled and goes to Laikipia, and that's why Laikipia is having a problem. The problem with Laikipia is coming from Baringo and other counties, because the animals are brought to Laikipia and sold in Nakuru, and then we end up in the markets here in our living rooms or in our dining tables. But if you had a world-class arbiter there, these young people who are with guns, they would be employed there, and, and it would be a different life for them, uh, so alternative livelihoods for them. But infrastructure is a major issue, so the road between Moyale and Isiolo is now finally complete, thanks to ADB for their financing. But it goes back to the uh, mid-60s or early 70s when President, all the way onto the Ethiopian border, is actually crossed into Ethiopia. But in the mid-60s, I think, and I don't know if it was true, but the story goes to say that late Emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, and late Mze Jomo Kenyatta, both agreed that they will meet on the border. You do the road on your side as part of the Trans-African Highway. I do on my part. We meet in Moyale. Ethiopia did theirs in the 60s. Tarmacked all the way to Moyale. Ours, it would take us three days to get there until recently. But now the road is there. You can go one day from here to Moyale. So we need to open up Turkana. Now because of the oil, probably Turkana will open up. But it's not yet. And the government maybe now has plans to build roads. 
But Lodwa should have had a road there a long time ago. If the bridge in Kainuk is disturbed, we can't even bring that oil now that we want to bring by road. But that needs an infrastructure from Kitale all the way to the Rukana needs to be done. Garissa, yes, I mean, uh, because of General Mahmoud and the power he had at the time, the road went from Mwingi to Garissa. It was tarmacked, but from Garissa all the way to Mandera, a thousand kilometers, you have nothing. You go to the same road that was done by the Italian prisoners during the Second World War, which is just a gravel thing. So we need to open up this infrastructure so that these communities who are pastoralists can bring their animals so they can deal with drought issues very quickly. And we can build abitwas. Kenya should be exporting big time meat. They said in the 60s too, Kenya taught Botswana that had not yet seen all these diamonds they have now and the world they have today on the meat industry and the cattle industry. Botswana today exports meat to European Union, to the US and the whole world because they got the act right together. We didn't get ours right. So infrastructure, no discussion about it. Is food, I mean politi uh, political, political causes of food insecurity? Well, I mean food has been used as a political power in Kenya for many years since independence. That's for a fact. Some areas that were marginalized, uh, they only knew food aid, and if you are loyal to the government of the day, then yeah, you could. It was politicized from a chief level to a DO, to a DC, to a PC then, uh, and to the ministers who were in charge of these ministries then. But I think all that is changing now, and I think as Robert Shaw was saying, things have opened up in this country, and, and people are more open to discuss things. But I hope with this new thinking of cash transfers, we can get away from food handouts, because dehumanizing. You know, when you give people cash, you give them back their dignity. A mama lining up for eight hours, ten hours, waiting for two or three gorogoros of, I don't know, five or six kilograms of food per month, is just not right. And we've done this for many years. People have been dehumanized, and people need to be given back their, their dignity, and cash transfer is the way to go. So, yeah, you can look at it the way you look at Kwale, Galana, Kulalu. Can I advise the government? If someone wants advice, you can give. It's not, if it's not asked for, you can't give it. But obviously, yes, the fact of the matter is Galana, Kulalu was said to be the solution to our problem. One million acres. What we know for now, and they have done well in the 10,000 acres they've been able to cultivate because it's costing a lot of money. But the 10,000, they're saying, okay, the yields are, you know, 20. They were expecting 40 uh, bags from uh, one acre, but now I think it's between 20 or close to 30. But I don't think there's enough water, and maybe that water needs to be caught so that we can increase the acreages that, that was planned for. But what we understand is about 10,000 acres have been done. Uh, yeah, and the Kwale one is a small project, a small success, in an, it's a small island, but we, we can expand that in other areas. As long as you have water, I believe anything and everything is possible. And you can have your mega project, like all these mega dams that are being planned for, I hope they would have enough water to then also do irrigations around it. But uh, you could drill boreholes. Uh, okay, Turkana is said to have a lot of water that can last Kenya for the next 70 years. But uh, again, there are discussion whether that water is actually of good quality or not, and this is the debate going on. So I hope the government will sooner or later find out the, the actual quality of the water. Quantity is not the issue, it's the quality. But still, with all that fine, not much has happened in terms of turning around the water needs of the people or meeting the needs of water for people from Turkana. But that's just general everywhere. So I think those were the questions that were asked. Uh, I think I will go straight to the questions that were directed to me and uh, I'll start by uh, saying that we will do our best to be visible and uh, we let the public know what we are doing uh, although we are happy that uh, what we are doing is reaching them but for the sake of uh, flow of information and to avoid distortion Will, will be going public. Number two, on uh, armyworms. Uh, this is a migratory pest native to South and North America. It's a moth. Uh, it's, it has capacity and ability to fly between 25 to 30 uh, kilometers a day, depending on the direction and speed of uh, wind. 
It lays a lot of eggs in patches of between 150 to 200. An adult can lay up to between 1,500 to 2,000 eggs, which hatch between uh, two to seven days, depending on the temperatures. And then they hatch. The larval stage is the most destructive, and that is where the problem is, because they feed on the foliages of uh, plants, especially maize, and they go right into the wall, so that makes it difficult. Uh, I think the Kefis and Caldro have come up with recommendations on which uh, chemicals to be used. They have released some farmlets. They advise that uh, the chemicals be alternated. One thing that it is good to mention is this is the first time the pest is coming in and there is no known or no product that is in the market that was actually designed or manufactured and prepared specifically to handle this pest. So they have a range of chemicals. The other one is on, um, I think there was a question on what is the government doing that can be able to target the small scale farmers. Uh, there are several programs. Uh, one is um, we have NALEP, the National Agriculture and Livestock uh, Extension Program that targets the small scale farmers. There was also EAP, there was EADD, though they were doing partnership. There is CAP, Kenya Agricultural Productivity Program. There is one that is sponsored by IFAD called Small Older Dairy Commercialization Program. There is Fish Farming Enterprise Productivity Program, um, among others. And of course, there is extension also that is now devolved. Uh, the government also is uh, looking at increasing the market access by ensuring that uh, or targeting to ensure that about 30 percent of the purchases are done from the small scale farmers. On the other last one that is controversial is on the GMOs and I think the ministry are, have allowed uh, I think testing of uh, of GMOs. I, I wouldn't want to say they have allowed the production of GMOs. As to the effects and uh, the negative effects, if any of the GMOs, I wouldn't want to say anything. But uh, what is good to note is that uh, where you have GMO products, it is well labeled that this is a GMO product. So that uh, is enough to raise your eyebrows that why is it mentioned that this is GMO? Uh, I wouldn't want to go beyond there. And as to whether there is um, a document or a write-up saying that uh, GMOs are 100% safe, I wouldn't want to go into that field now. But uh, as I mentioned, it is that controversial. I think for now, that is all I have. Thank you. I just want to before uh, MD come to answer some of the things, I worked for ADC for 37 years. They called me the dictionary of ADC. I just wanted to point out some, uh, just to comment, I'm not asking my MD a question. Okay. One of the things, because I have that, where did we go wrong? One of the things is that we used to have advisory section in the Ministry of Agriculture. Take for example, if you go along Kinongi, what do you see, what do you see them growing? Maize. And when it reaches two feet, it dries up. Is that an area for me? I know. It is not. Division of farms, I saw it all. ADC used to produce enough to feed this country and export. But the problem is that some of those farms that were subdivided or given to an age, they are not productive. If you go there now, you can even 
as they are saying, was they the farm? The big, the so-called big farmers, they don't cultivate. If you go there, you find a fallow farm. And you're wondering, why did you want to farm? Those farms that were given to settlement, they are not economic at all. Because somebody will want to grow pyretra, a small piece there, and keep either condo or even a harahara. And yet, it, if that farm was growing weight, and now it is doing those small things, it is not economic at all. I want also to, to mention to Dr. Bass and everybody here who is interested to, to hear for free. This drought is livestock are dying. During those days, ADC had what was called known as feedlot. ADC used to buy those animals before they become so weak, come and feed them. After a few months taken to KMC at a reasonable price. The feedlots are no longer there because for some reasons that I don't want to mention. Yeah, why don't you want to mention now we are... Um, we want this, to is a this is a government, uh, <laughs> a, polit a political government. For example, you see that you come from Baringo. I, I live there. Yeah. I was living in a tent. <laughs> I saw Baringo throughout before I joined Minister of Agriculture and then I joined ADC. So um, let us have policies uh, that will protect the remaining ADC farms. Because even the remaining ones, I still serve in, a, in one of his uh, land wards somewhere in, in ADC. We say that even now some people still after the remaining farms of ADC, and that is not fair. And that's why we don't have enough. Okay, sir. Uh, lastly, uh, I'm just about to finish. Seeds. You require a reasonable area to grow seeds. But even after production, one of the reasons contributing to uh, a, lot, a small quantity, some unscrupulous people normally take ordinary means and pack the package. When you go to buy it, you think that you are buying seed from ABC. So you better be careful when you want to buy something. Please, ABC office is just here, development house. And I would ask that uh, get information from ABC. We have got officers here, and we have got officers there. They will, if at a Jakula ya Kuku, Kitaka Utapata. Okay, wow. Thank you. Next question. Hello, my name is Janet. I'm a teacher. I want to ask a question on the policy research on diversification of foods. I don't know whether it, is, it, it exists. And if it doesn't, then we need to ask ourselves a question. What did the Chinese do such that they are able to eat rats, dogs, you know, and snakes, and what have you? We need a policy, maybe, an implementation plan for food diversification. It is critically missing in this country. Okay. Also, um, I was just asking a quick one, Dr. Baz, about uh, how they are planning to sustain the beautiful projects they are starting all over the nation. I hope they won't uh, create the dependency syndrome that is also crying about. Thank you. Critical. Okay. My name is June, civil society. I just want to ask one question. There was a time, not very long ago, that we were told uh, a lot of water had been discovered in Turkana. In so much water that it could feed the country, it could last the country for 70 years. What happened? Because what we are talking about is centered on water. Because uh, now everybody is concentrating on the black gold, of course, which is oil. But nobody, nobody, nobody is talking about that water uh, in Turkana. Noted. What happened? Noted. Noted. Any point made? <laughs> Next. And then, another issue is, let's look at us as, uh, as uh, Kenyans or as Africans. If you see Americans the way they do their things, if there is an emergency anywhere in the world, within no time, they will supply food, uh, you know, and take care of logistics and everything. Yet here in Kenya, 
not not Matoke can move from Kisi to Turkana. Okay, uh, my name is San Francisco I'm a member of civil rights and a business person. Um, uh, basically, if you look at uh, statistics currently, uh, close to 60% of innocent children are dying due to malnourished conditions. Uh, what is this? Why is this happening? Because a lot of our women, our mamas, are not better educated in terms of what best nutritional products are they supposed to uh, provide to their children. Why is this happening? And how can it be addressed? My second uh, as aspect is uh, uh, if you look at um, uh, basically the, the, the aspect of um, um, uh, okay, I, I wanted to find out in the area of, uh, of water harvest because you find out that we now the rainy season has started and what mechanisms uh, is the government going to do in terms of uh, improved infrastructure um, mechanisms so that then we could not have water going to waste because uh, to avoid the aspect of uh, 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 drought situations and conditions. Okay, sir. Thank you. I want at this point to ask uh, the uh, presenters, the panelists, uh, to uh, respond to any of the questions that touches at them and also to make their final submissions. So, Robert? On, on food diversification, yes, I, I'm, I, I agree. I think what, what, what we do need is, is a very proactive public education uh, policy on it. Um, because uh, and, uh, obviously <coughs> coupled with that is the emphasis on the fact that there are many foods which do not require as much water. So why are you growing maize in some areas when you could have a, a fantastic crop of, of, of other products? I think, I think that just getting that across uh, as public education is, is, is probably the most important thing to do. And, and the mediums are there. I mean, you know, we're, we're in an age now where, you know, we can look up anything, get anything. And, and, and uh, so, so let's, let's take it advantage of it um, you know as we know social media is it, you can't hide anything so why not use it if you like in the proactive way um, malnourishment it's a very very difficult one because the issue that you get is is cost isn't it um, I think I would go probably to to, to uh, uh, a basis of a point Maybe one of the ways of doing it is, is, is cash. I mean, it, it is a very... Okay, you would be limited if, if, if the costs were much higher due to shortfalls, etc. But it's probably a more efficient, or it is, more efficient way of getting something to someone which they then make up their mind and say, I need food, I will buy, rather than food aid. Food aid has this traditional joke that the farther it goes, the less it becomes. Because as it's going, bits and pieces are being taken off. And I'm sure that's still, still the case. Um, so so I, I would say one of the ways of doing it probably is, 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 is to, to, to uh, not be physically... Remember, a lot of the cost in food aid is the transport. It's damn expensive in the end to get it from, you know, one part of the country to another. But uh, cash, it's not. Or it's, it, 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 you know, you get much greater value for the money. Uh, than you would of the amount of food aid that get, is getting to some of these areas now. That, that's all I have. This is a, a serious and a, and, a, and a big question because um, the kind of funding that we get uh, is largely annual or project-based. So 
the idea here is when you do the project, uh, if you're not going to have a multi-year project, then we're in trouble. Because uh, if you're changing livelihoods of, uh, lifestyles of people and attitudes of people, let's say in Turkana, Kaikor, where we were now teaching pastoralists to become farmers, we stayed there for a couple of years. Unfortunately, when we left, because we didn't have resources to keep people full-time there, then there was a challenge. So a behavioral change takes time, and we are realizing that with our projects, we need to be there much longer, maybe three years or even longer. Uh, in Kuala, we have been there for about two and a half years, and now it's getting a stage where we're saying, you must take over yourself. This is your project, you must own it. We won't be here forever because we, don't, we will not have the funding for that long. So there, there are serious issues, okay? And the idea is we are now engaging more and more county government, so the county agriculture department takes over this. You can initiate projects, you train the community, they form cooperatives, they put money aside to go buy the next generation of seeds when you need to now uh, put new seeds again. So it's a difficult uh, issue, but uh, some are quick in the uptake, some are slow. Uh, we saw that uh, with the pastoralist communities particularly, it's very difficult uh, to change overnight and we are realizing that we have to be there slightly longer than we had originally planned for so but involving county governments would would help so i think in just summarizing i would just want to say that um, with all said and done it is possible to reverse the food insecurity in this country if we all put in our resources and energy and if everyone stay focused and accountable I'm sure we can overcome this by reversing the trend uh, that today we are net food aid recipient to what we want to be a net food aid, uh, a net food exporter as a, as a nation. And again, it's just to say that we can always lament and blame the government, but we are all part and parcel, and it needs a collective uh, efforts in partnership internally in the country, the private sector, the civil society, the <coughs> NGOs, the government, uh, and even donors from outside who, like uh, the, 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 the sponsor of this event, um, that how do we better use these resources to reach this ultimate goal that we want to be as a nation and we should benchmark against the best in the world. Thank you very much. The challenges that we see, we need to come in and fill the gap and especially in whatever you do if you ever venture into farming it is important to have good information on what you want to do how you do it how it is done elsewhere because i've realized there is a knowledge gap uh, many people would see somebody doing something and say i think i want to do it without getting all the necessary information and knowledge. That brings about the big variance that is seen between the research yields and the actual yields on the ground. That gap needs to be bridged. And if that is done, everybody should be able to contribute because uh, the, the, the net effect of what we do is the sum total of what we see as a country. If everybody is able to feed himself, then you will be able to contribute to the country's um, avoidance of importing in one area or in one crop. And that way we will be able to even um, feed ourselves and be able to make the cost of living to be low. What I know there are some sayings in some other trad languages or traditions or they say that the food that you buy you cannot manage to fill your granary with but what you produce from your farm can fill the granary. Thank you very much. It was granted. I would say it in the language that uh, uh, everybody can understand but for the purpose of security I would want to uh, stop there. I think it's very evident, uh, Kara, um, that uh, this is not a one-time conversation. We will need to have another conversation uh, that we can address these issues. Uh, number two is that uh, the policy recommendations that have come 
from these conversations needs to be shared with the relevant departments, particularly if you could have a small uh, report from this engagement that can actually be shared with those relevant uh, stakeholders. I think with that, I want to say that uh, we have had a great conversation. I want to say a big thank you to uh, the, the, the panelists, and that is um, starting with Mr. Robert Shaw, who is a public policy and economic analyst. Uh, Robert Shaw, thanks so much for your time and your insights. I also want to thank, uh, say a big thank you. I've already done it, but uh, as part of the program, to Dr. Abbas Gullet, uh, the Secretary General of the Kenya Red Cross Society. I want to thank you, Mr. Richard Diabe, uh, for your time and your insights that you've shared. And also want to thank the panelists, uh, you, the questions. Uh, people are still seated telling you that uh, people were really engaged and committed to this topic. I think with that, I want to say that um, uh, may the Lord uh, bless you. In our preamble, we acknowledge the supremacy of God. So I will say that uh, may uh, wish you a great day ahead and, uh, and a fruitful uh, uh, week. I think uh, with that, I want to say that by the powers bestowed upon me as a moderator, uh, we have, uh, with the, uh, we enjoy the courtesy of uh, Kara. We have refreshments served. I think they're served outside. Uh, please enjoy as we continue with the conversation. With that, good day and God bless. My name is Vincent Kimosok. It's been great being your moderator and an honor and a centenary son. <laughs>